We have Chessy with us. He has an interesting story. He's a former Muslim. Uh, thank you for coming, Chessy. Glad to be here. Uh, let me know first how um, uh, you became a Muslim and give me a background and uh, uh, how the process you went from. A, were you a Christian first? Yes, I was raised in a Christian home, Christian household. And so how that happened? Well, um, my first contact with Islam was through the autobiography of Malcolm X and hip hop music. Mm. You read the biography and then you were influenced or like? A... Actually in like 10th grade in high school, we had an assignment. We had to read the autobiography of Malcolm X and, and I read it. I was very interested in it. It really captured my attention. And I wanted to know more about Malcolm X and, and about Islam also. And uh, that made you search more for uh, answers and uh, about Islam? Yeah, uh, that made me search more. Like I said, I read the book, I read his biography. I would read anything I could get about him. And then the movie, the Malcolm X movie mm. came out by Spike Lee. And that really just inflamed my, my passion to want to know more about Islam. Because mm. I saw for like the first time, like the Kaaba and mm. people going on Hajj. So I became very interested in it. And uh, um, how did you start your research? How did you find out more about Islam, the, the religion, not just like a biography and a movie? Well, after the biography and the movie, like I said, and the music, um, I, this is like when the internet first be started becoming popular, you know. So um, I went online and started just, you know, searching Islam, you know, mm. and see what I can get. And maybe like the first thing I ever read online was from the Nation of Islam. I would read from their website and some of their material. And then from other groups like uh, this uh, group called the Nation of Gods and Earths, the 5% Nation. Mm. And I, re I would read their material as well. And did you get to know Islam through these two um, sects? Uh, somewhat, because they're not, I mean, Orthodox Muslims wouldn't consider them in their same category. Right. They have beliefs that are totally alien from the Quran and the Sunnah. Right. So I began, people were telling me, well, you need to learn more about real Islam. Mm. And I, I didn't really, well, what's real Islam? <laughs> you know, right. I didn't know what the difference is between the two things. Right. So I just kept reading and searching and going to bookstores, trying to read anything I can to really understand what is Islam about. And and you found books and, and the Quran and, and the Hadith and all that? Yeah, there was a bookstore in the city I lived near my job. There was a Sunni Islamic bookstore. So that was like a great resource, so to speak, for me. I went in there, I got a Quran, I got books on Islam. I was able to go in and have conversations with people and talk to people about Islam, ask questions. And so I, I really began to learn about Sunni Islam at that point. What were your goals for um, learning about Islam? Were you interested to become a Muslim or just like um, uh, curiosity and knowledge? I was interested in knowing the truth, mm. period. I just wanted to know the truth. Who is God? Mm. You know, uh, what's heaven? You know, what happens after I die? What's the point of life? What's the true religion, you know? These are like questions I just had at the time. Why you didn't search Christianity? Yeah. I was searching Christianity, mm. uh, you know. Um, I was searching every religion, really. At this point, I was Buddhism, uh, New Age. I would mm. read about anything. Wow. Um, it was just that in the long run, Islam really captured my attention. Okay. Um, can you mention like one element that like was the main element that catched your attention in Islam? Well, um, for me, it was the discipline of Islam mm. that really was the clincher, that really attracted me. I felt like Muslims, you know, these people aren't just people who talk about God or, you know, talk about how to get to heaven. These guys are very diligent. They're very disciplined. They get up early in the morning to pray. They have a schedule. Um, they reminded me of like people in the Old Testament, mm. but they were living today, you know. So I was like, well, these people must have the truth. 
because they they live more like you know Moses than the people at my church. Hmm. And so you like that discipline. Yes. You wanted to be like them. Yes. And um, reading about Islam, did you were you able to take a decision or just like more information and more information? Well, it was just more information, more information. Um, I I was I I was very interested in Islam, but I just couldn't bring myself to take the Shahada. Hmm. Um, and I actually took the Shahada finally at the bookstore that I told you about that I visited. The bookstore owner, he had assumed that I was Muslim because I came there all the time. Mm. And um, he asked me one day, are you Muslim? Have you taken Shahada? I said, I, I haven't taken Shahada yet. And he Did directed, you know Shahada at that I knew, time? I, yeah, I knew what the Shahada was, mm. but I hadn't taken it yet. And there happened to be another person in the bookstore store named Ahmed, and he directed me to him. And we went into a corner and he explained like the pillars of Islam, what the Shahada was. Uh, and he asked me, do you want to take the Shahada now? And I, and I took it right there. So you said the Shahada at the bookstore. Yes. Did they do like a follow up? Like you have to pray at certain time, you have to wash, you have to do that. Did they, they, uh, they follow with you or you just say Shahada and you are gone? And like you, uh, you, you live your life. Now, there was follow-up. Uh, they gave me like a small little book, like the basics of Islam, and explain mm. who's Allah, who's Muhammad, the pillars of Islam, how to make wudu, how to make salah. And uh, he invited me to his mosque. And I went to his mosque, and he was a tabliki, from the Jamiat Tablik. Mm. And uh, there was a, a mir, a sheikh of the community, and I met him, and we talked, and we actually talked for like seven or eight hours. I just asked him questions, and he showed me how to make wudu and everything. And um, did you learn a lot from them, like about your m new Muslim life? Yeah, I learned a lot. Um, I wasn't with them for a long time. Uh, just a few days I spent with them. But I, I got a lot of questions as I learned. Uh, like I said, I learned the very basic minimum of Islam. You know, uh, Tawheed, how to pray, how to purify yourself what not to eat, really basic information. Were you able to practice Islam when you went back? Yeah, I started practice, trying to practice Islam immediately. It was very hard. It was mm. a big change in lifestyle from the way I'd uh, been living my life up to that point. Uh, so the first few months, it was kind of hard adjusting. Mm. Um, but uh, one day I ran into uh, the Imam's son and I, I really wasn't practicing that much. And, I, and I, he saw me and I didn't have a beard and, you know, and I was embarrassed that he saw me and I wasn't practicing. So that kind of was like, I really have to get myself together, you know. So you went further. Yes, I, I really began to attend the mosque on a regular basis. Um, I began to buy more books on Islam. I, began, I read the Quran, at least the translation of the meaning of the Quran. Um, at this point, and I really began making my prayers, all my prayers on time, you know, being really di diligent at this point. Were you able to memorize some verses from the Quran? I, I was able to memorize some. Um, at one point, I had a Quran teacher, mm. uh, and he was teaching me Quran and memorizing and Tajweed. Mm. And so we would meet up every morning and we would go through the Quran. Because you had to pray in Arabic and like from day one, actually, and uh, like you have to learn, you can't pray in another language, you have to pr do the prayer in Arabic. That's correct. So weren't you asking yourself, like, how come like God understands all languages? Why should I pray just in Arabic? At first, no, because I, I felt like, because a lot of, I've been reading a lot of just propaganda on the internet about Christianity. Mm. You know, the Bible's corrupt. Uh, mm. It was invented at the Council of Nicaea. So I felt like because it was in Arabic, a Middle Eastern language, this is more pure. This is more closer to the original, what was mm. really true as, as, as a, opposed to this corruption of the English language, you know. All right. Yeah. So is it is it kind of rejection of the culture? Like I I don't want this culture with with its language, with everything, its religion and everything included. I would say so. Um, growing up, um, I didn't know a lot about Islam, mm. but I knew about Malcolm X. I knew about Farrakhan, and a lot of people took them as heroes because uh, you know 
they felt like black people were mistreated in America. And these people were, were not afraid to stand up and tell America, you know, what you look what you did to our people. So we looked at them, looked at these people as heroes, even though we didn't understand their religion, but we looked at them as heroes. So the whole idea of Islam was like, okay, I can, I can believe in God and I can worship God, but I don't have to necessarily do it the same way as mainstream white America. Right. And, and did you like feel that Christianity is a racist religion, like belongs to uh, the white men or like something like that? Were you taught anything like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, especially with the Nation of Islam type material that I read, but even in the Sunni Islam material, it was always like, you know, the car, the Bible is corrupt, you know, mm. that's the King James version. King James made that, um, that has nothing to do with the, you know, the prophets and the messengers and the previous revelation, the Injil and the Torah, you know, so I felt like, you know, the Bible, Christianity, this is just a corruption that was created in Europe. You know, mm -hmm. I want to get back to the roots of what's really true. Right. Um, going back to what you uh, were taught about Islam, like the surahs and the hadiths and everything. How did you grow in your knowledge and your, in your Islamic faith? Well, like I said, I began to go to the mosque on a regular basis. Uh, the mosque I was going to at the time, it was, they didn't have a lot of activities. They would just have the Friday prayer and that was it. Uh, and as I began to meet more people, um, I went to different places. Like uh, originally I was with the Jamia Tablik. I went among those people. Um, then I went to a, a mosque with the Jamil Alamin group. Um, they were kind of really radical. Mm. Actually, too radical for me, even. What's uh, what's so special about them that made them radical? Well, uh, Jamil Alamin, uh, his original name he was known by was H. Rat H. Rap Brown. He, was, he lived in Atlanta. He was um, a figure in the civil rights movement with the organization called SNCC, and he was he began uh, the first SNCC. They did a lot of protests and marches, and they got tired of protests and marches. They kind of disagree with uh, Martin Luther King's, um, you know, nonviolent uh, th uh, theology. And they wanted to become more active, more radical. Uh, he ended up going to prison and he converted to Islam. When he got out, he sp spread, he just became a missionary for Islam. And the people who came under his leadership became known as the Jamil Alamin. So the mosque I was going to, like the guys were always talking about jihad, it always anti-American rhetoric. Um, everybody carried guns. Some people were convicted uh, criminals and they shouldn't have had guns, but they carried guns anyway. Uh, the Imam of the mosque carried two guns. You know, he would pull them out during his sermons and he would talk about how he was ready for jihad and he was ready to go to war. And at this point, this is right before 9-11 happened. 9-11 happens, you know, I was like, I really began to kind of question Islam. You were a Muslim at yeah, that yeah, time. Yeah, I was Muslim at the time. I, I'll be honest, I, I, I began to question Islam, like, is Islam violent? Is it, you know, a terrorist religion? Because mm. I'm around these guys and they're always talking about terrorism. And then this happens, mm. you know. Um, so I didn't want to, they, they invited me one day to come to a meeting to discuss, you know, what was going on and what we can do and what can we do about the situation of America. I didn't go to the meeting because uh, I knew I didn't want to hear what they were talking about. Mm. I didn't want to be involved in that. Mm. But you still stayed a Muslim. I still stayed a Muslim. So w w weren't you like asking probably there is some violence in this yeah. religion, and, but in the same time you didn't take a decision like to, to get out of it? No, I didn't uh, take the decision to completely get out of it at that point. Mm. I, 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 I began to doubt it. I very much doubt it. And I was in contact with some Christians at the time. But then um, I discovered, I met some new friends and they happened to be Salafis mm. and they were into Salafi Islam and they were telling me, well, yeah, there is jihad in Islam, but it's regulated. There's certain rules, there's regulations, it's not, just not grab a gun and go off and shoot people or, you know, just grab an airplane and smash it into a building. You know, you have, there, there's uh, rules in the Sharia that the way things have to be done. So it's not as wild as you think it is. Mm. So I kind of believed it, you know, uh, I, feel, uh, I went for that. And um, so I got you, you became a Salafi. I became a Salafi. I got invited to a conference 
at um, an organization called QSS, Quran and Sunnah Society. And I was very impressed. And you know, it seemed to be, one thing that impressed me about it was the guys were constantly quoting the Quran and the Hadith, and they were backing up what they had to say from original sources, because that's what the movement, movement is supposed to be about, following the way of the predecessors. Mm. So I began to be with them, and I, got, I went headlong into the Salafi movement. Wow. And uh, within the Salafi movement, did you find yourself? Did you find your, what you were looking for? Yeah. Um, after that point, I moved, I moved into Dearborn area. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, basically, this, Islam became my whole entire life. I spent all my free time at the masjid, at the mosque. Um, I dressed in uh, Islamic garb, Jalabiya, Kufi, uh, Gutra, everything, you know, and I was always with the Muslims, always. We were constantly studying Quran, studying Hadith, listening to recordings from like the scholars from Saudi Arabia and Yemen. That became my whole entire life. Did you go to the Middle East? I didn't get a chance to go to the Middle East, even though I wanted to. I wanted to go to Yemen to study, uh, but I, I just, it just never got to the, I never got the money to be able to go. Were you planning to go to Hajj if, if, if money was available? Yeah, I, I wanted to go to Hajj also. Yeah, but I never got a chance to go. Yeah. Um, tell me that uh, some of the things that you learned in Islam that, um, probably started like making doubts in your mind or like well, how, how did it happen because um, we're going to get to the point where you left Islam but mm -hmm. like any turning point any questions that started in your mind and what triggered them to be honest with you the thing yeah. that I never had at this point I was totally I believe Islam was the complete truth mm. the Quran was the truth the Sunnah was the truth I, no doubts ever came to my mind until I got married Mm. And I began to have arguments with my wife. Um, I wanted my wife to basically wear jabab, niqab, and gloves. Your, your wife is and a Muslim. She's Muslim. So I wanted her to dress, you know, completely covered. And I always wanted her to, I wanted her to get up early in the morning before Fajr to study Quran, to study, you know, the, the books of the scholars. And she felt like, oh, this is too much for me. You know, you're pushing me too hard. And, and I felt like, well, you're being lazy, you know. If you really believe in Allah and His Messenger, then you need to be diligent about how you are, and especially the way you dress. We used to argue a lot about the way she dressed. Mm. Um, and one day during the argument, she just looked at me and she said, you're brainwashed, mm. you know. And I was, I became, I was shocked and angry at the same time. So I was, I never considered anything like that. And I was angry that she would say something like this, you know, it was kind of blasphemous. Um, but it also, but in the back of my mind, it made me think, you know, am I brainwashed? You know, mm. you know, cause she said, like everything you say, the brothers at the mosque, they say the same exact thing. You all say the same exact words. Do you, you don't have an independent mind, you know? But she's still a Muslim. Like she mm -hmm. believes that, the, <laughs> that it's not within Islam that yeah. she has to dress that way and gets up <laughs> yeah. in the morning or like she, she, how the how does she explain like um well she was a lot more liberal okay. than i was all right that's the that was the problem i okay. was very conservative and she was uh, slightly more liberal you wanted to practice islam as it is in the yeah, text exactly and she wanted to live like uh, as a liberal muslim yeah you know so how, how that ended well uh we had a child and we were trying to get our marriage together we went to the mosque we met with the imam. The imam told me, uh, just give her talaq, you know, just divorce her, you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to divorce her, you know, and uh, she ended up uh, getting a uh, kula. Uh, she got to dissolve the, the marriage. Mm -hmm. And um, at that point... She we, did? Yeah, she dissolved the marriage. Wow. Yeah, so um, that kind of devastated me. That really, on an emotional level. You had a child at that time? Yeah, I had a child at the time. And, you know, I really wanted to be with my child. I wanted to raise him in Islam. You know, I wanted to raise him from childhood to be strong upon the Quran and the Sunnah. That was, that was my dream. Were you mm -hmm. married in a mosque first? We were married in the mosque. And then the khawah happened in the mosque as yes. well? Yes. Okay. So yeah. the imam did everything? Yeah. Yeah. 
So, and I would go to the people in the mosque, and I was like, I want to get back with my wife. And, and like I said, the imam, he said, just go get someone else, you know, mm. leave her alone, you know, she's crazy, you know. So, um, we kind of went our separate, separate ways, but it, uh, that really had a big effect on me. It was, I can say my heart was completely hard up mm. until that point. That was the first thing that cracked my heart to make me feel emotional mm. and to think on my own outside of Islam, you know? And I began to think like, I've been doing everything the Quran and Sunnah says. I'm living my whole entire life by the Sunnah. Mm. From the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, everything I do is according to the Sunnah. I walk into the bathroom according to the Sunnah. I use the bathroom according to the Sunnah. Doing everything you want, Allah, you know? How did this happen? You know, how did this happen to me, you know? Mm. You know, I just, and it really, uh, for, for the next like year or two, it really bothered me. Um, I began to just really struggle with being Muslim. I didn't feel any closeness to God or Allah mm. at all. And it was 2010, it was Ramadan. Oh, and, you did Ramadan all these years? Yeah, I did Ramadan all those years, yeah. Okay. So it was Ramadan 2010, and I, I, I was just feeling like my, my faith was weak. And I was like, you know, I need to really struggle and strive this Ramadan to uh, renew my faith. So I, I, the whole Ramadan, I was always at the masjid, praying, uh, night prayer, spending the night at the mosque, doing everything I thought I could do to just restart my Islam. And after Islam ended the next day. After Ramadan ended. After, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, after um, Ramadan, the next day, I was, it felt like I was right back at point A. Mm. Like I was right back to where my faith was feeling weak. And I used to do a lot of, uh, try to do dawah. You know, go to the Christians. streets. Yeah, you know, go to the streets sometimes, but a lot of internet stuff. I would debate Christians on the internet. And so around this time, I happened to be debating a Christian on uh, YouTube, you know? And the Christian said to me, you believe Allah can do all these different things. You believe Allah comes down during the last third of the night. Uh, and he, you know, he asks, who's, uh, who's praying for me? So why can't Allah become a man? Is, he's not able to? Mm. And I was like, well, he, it's not that he's not able to. It's just he wouldn't do that. That's not his majesty. It, it would violate his majesty. Mm. So he's like, why, 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 if he can do, if he can come down during the last third of the night in a way that uh, suits his majesty, why can't he incarnate? in a way that suits his majesty. That's right. Yeah. So I began to think about that, like, yeah, why couldn't he, <laughs> you know, do that in a way that suits his majesty? And that question really bothered me, you know? So I have all this other stuff. I got personal stuff with my wife, my wife, my ex-wife at this time. My faith is low. These conversations I'm having with Muslims. With it, Christians. With, I'm sorry, with Christians. Yeah. And um, it all just came together at once. And it really, uh, this is the, f the per a point in my life where I just really became open to question Islam and to rethink what it is I've, I've been doing all this time. Mm. So where did you start? Well, I said, you know, I asked myself, if I die today, what is going to happen to me? Mm. Am I going to Jannah? And I felt like, my imam, my iman is not strong. I don't know if I'm going to Jannah or not. I don't know where I'm going to go. So you didn't yeah. have insurance? I had no insurance, nothing. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And then, you know, having that feeling, and then you get up in the morning to pray salah, it's like, I'm getting up in the morning to pray, but I don't even know if I'm going to heaven or not. You know, it's mm. like, what am I doing this for? It was, you know, so I started thinking about Christianity again, because that's, that's the religion I was raised in. Mm. It's what I knew the most about, is what my family was, it's, you know. And then, you know, and up to that time, before Christianity, I was involved in church. I, I read the Bible, and I had been baptized. I knew about Christianity to a well, certain extent. How, how did it affect your family when, when you announced that you became a Muslim? Well, uh, actually one of my family members, my father, he ended up taking Shahada. Uh, my other family members, they kind of like, they were like, they thought it was strange, mm. but they wouldn't, they wouldn't try to challenge me about it. Because I tried to give them dawah. 
I was trying to give everyone in my family. You got dawa. your dad. Yeah, I got my dad. So I was trying to give everyone in my family dawa, and they weren't really equipped to uh, address many of the things I was saying to mm. them. They didn't know how to answer, you know. Right. And I would tell them, you know, Jesus was never really crucified. Mm. The Bible was created at the Council of Nicaea. And I would say these things. They didn't know what to say. Right. So they kind of try to avoid speaking to me about it. Right. So um, going back to the struggle you you were living in, and like you have no insurance, you have questions, you have doubts, you have everything. How did you like um, start getting out of Islam? Well, it was in December of 2010. Mm -hmm. I was just all alone. I was I had an apartment and I was staying by myself at this time because before this I, I stayed with Muslims. Um, I stayed in the house with uh, lots of Muslims. I was always around Muslims, and I had moved at this point. I moved out of Dearborn, mm. and I moved to another area. So I was kind of away from all my f uh, friends and the community I, I had. So I spent a lot of time alone. And spending time alone, I, I really began to think about all these different questions that were going through my mind, especially about what's going to happen to me when I'm when I when I'm die when I die. So I just had this overall just feeling like I just I, I need to read the Bible I need to get a Bible you know it's just like a, this urge inside of me like get a Bible and read it so I just uh, went online let me just googled the Bible and Matthew was always my favorite uh, gospel mm -hmm. growing up so I just began to read Matthew and I read the whole entire book of Matthew in one night and by the time I finished reading it, I just, in my heart, I knew I didn't believe in Islam anymore. Wow. You know, I was like, Jesus, Jesus offers salvation. You know, he's us. I, I, I'm in need of saving. Mm. And Jesus is a savior. Mm, right. <laughs> so I, I need Jesus. You know, this is the perfect relationship. No, there's no savior in Islam. Mm. I'm, I've been trying to save myself for the last decade. And after... Even just from I'm looking at my worldly life, it's in shambles, you know. I, it's not going well. And I'm not even sure about my afterlife. So I've dedicated myself on all this time to Quran and Sunnah and to Islam. And I don't even know where I'm going to go when, I'm, when I die. And I don't even have my earthly life together. I need somebody to save me. And Christ was a savior. And right. I just knew in my heart that this, no, it wasn't corrupt. It's not a lie. It's not the white man. No, Jesus is a savior. And that weekend, that Saturday, in my heart, I left Islam, mm. in my heart. But it, that Monday, I was at work. I was working at the time, and I said, how can you keep waiting? You know, you don't even believe in Islam anymore. But you st did you still, like, during those days, pray the Islamic prayer, did the rituals and stuff? I wasn't even making salah at the time. Mm. So I was like, are you going to make salah? What's going to happen? Are you going to go to the masjid? People were calling, asking where you're at, mm. you know. Did you try to ask any imam or sheikh uh, some of these questions? Why we don't have insurance? How can I be sure of going to Jannah and all that? At this point, like during this weekend where I was having this experience, no, I didn't speak to any Muslims. I completely closed myself off. Before that? Before that, yes, you know, I, you know, I, I, I researched and I knew, I knew the answers. I, I spoke to imams and shits, you know. Well, you know, what they would say and what I would read is, you know, just make sure that you believe, you're firm upon your tawheed, and you're following the Quran and the Sunnah, and you do your good deeds, and then you will be in the hands of Allah. But if, as long as you believe in Islam and you're practicing Islam, you'll be okay. Mm. You know? So let's go back to the, 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 the last week. Yeah. How, how did it end? Well, like I said, at this point, in my heart, even though I hadn't said anything out loud to anyone or even to myself at this point, but in my heart, I left Islam. Mm. I didn't believe it, but I believe Christ. But uh, technically, you could say I was still Muslim. Right. So I'm, I'm asking myself, what are you going to do now? Because I was afraid. I was afraid. Afraid of what? I was afraid of being wrong. Mm. Um, I was afraid maybe the shaitan is deceiving me, you know. Right. I was afraid to tell people. I was afraid somebody might do something to me. I was afraid what was going to happen, you know, with my son, you know, am I, it's going to cause problems. 
mm-hmm. more problems in my life than I have now. You know, I was afraid of persecution. I was afraid of it, just the unknown. What's going to happen at this point? What's going to happen to my life after I confess Christ? You know, so, but like I said, the same power of feeling that came over me that made me have to read the Bible, made me have to confess Christ, confess Christ. It's like, it's like a feeling of, I, I, I can't sit here mm. and just pretend to be Muslim. It's, the words have to come out of my mouth. So, I, like I said, I was at work. I took my break. I went in the back of my job, got down on my knees, and I said, Jesus, I confess you as my Lord, my Savior. Wow. Yeah. And then just tears just bursted out of my of my eyes at that point. You know, I went in the bathroom, cleaned myself up, you know, and I started telling people that I left Islam. And I even actually, I did a video and put it on YouTube mm. telling people, because I felt another feeling uh, besides having to read the Quran, read, read the Bible, confess Christ. I had this overwhelming feeling that I have to tell people that I was wrong. Because, like I said, I grew up a Christian. I publicly said that Christ was not Christ. He wasn't the Lord. He wasn't God. He wasn't the Savior. I publicly was saying that the Bible was not real. And that, that you know, what was real was Allah and his messenger and the Quran and the Sunnah. So I had this overwhelming feeling, I have to uh, recant in public mm. what I've said for these last 11 years. So I just put something on the internet and said, I was wrong. You know, Christ is the Lord. Christ is Savior. And a lot of people from my mall saw it. And they started contacting me by phone and by computers. What's wrong with you? Have you gone crazy? You know, because mm. I was actually the last person anybody would think would become a Christian. Mm. You know, and I had a converse, conversations on the phone, long hour long conversations with some of the people I knew. And that the spirit just put a boldness on me. I was like, listen, Muhammad is not a prophet. How did you know that? I just, <laughs> I just knew. It was just like a week ago, you, but, were like, <laughs> you were a devout Muslim. Yeah, this is true. But a lot of the evidence like I can give you, I already knew. I knew the evidence already. I just chose to not look at it. Mm. I chose to not think about it, you know. I had always, there was always an excuse why that couldn't possibly be true, you mm. know. Um, so when you put everything public, like publicly on the internet, yeah. um, people were mad at you? People were, some people were mad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> some people were cursing me and saying, may Allah destroy you and kill you and whatnot. Some people were concerned, more showing concern, like what's, what's the matter? What happened to you? Right. You know, have you gone crazy, you know? Um, so after maybe a few weeks, uh, I don't know this for certain, but I believe so like some of the imams told people to stop speaking to me. Mm. And so people stopped speaking to me after that point. Um, so basically they wrote me off and said that I went crazy and that was it. Leave him alone. Don't speak to him anymore. Did you try to reach out like to them or go back? Yeah, or? There were a few people I tried to reach out to and I even had kind of, went back and forth with and I tried to explain to them, I, was, I explained in detail why I left Islam. These are the reasons I left Islam. You know, the, you say you believe in the previous scriptures. The only previous scriptures that exist is the Bible. There is no other previous scripture. If you claim that this has been corrupt, you claim that there was some other revelation, where is it at? You know, are you basing your life on uh, an, another Injil, another Torah, that nobody's ever read or seen before, you know? Right. I see this, I see the Bible, I can pick it up and read it right now. Show me this other Injil and other Torah. Right. Nobody can show it to you. It just, it exists, but it doesn't exist, you know? I was like, that's not, that's, that's like building your house upon sand, mm. you know? Why do I want to build my house upon sand when Jesus is the rock? And I you know, began to tell the people like, look at Muhammad, how could he be a prophet? Look mm. at the thing, look at his behavior, look at his attitude. What prophet ever behaved like this? What prophet was visited by an angel and he was afraid of the angel? He wanted to commit suicide. You know, mm. he went. He thought he went crazy. He had to run to his wife. When did that ever happen to Moses or Abraham or anybody like that? Doesn't that sound weird to you? You mm. know, and people would just get silent. They just wouldn't know what to say. 
And you knew yeah. this at that time? I knew I knew that. I knew all the during now the time I was Muslim. I knew that. Mm. But I didn't I didn't I didn't it was almost like there was like a veil over my eyes. I knew it, but I didn't I didn't want to acknowledge it. Well, sometimes like I give people excuse if they are ignorant or like they don't know some stuff yeah. because they are new to Islam and yeah. they, they don't know hadith. Like you have to be really, um, I mean, deep into the yeah. go read Sahih Bukhari, Sahih yeah. Muslim, the biography of Muhammad according to Ibn Hisham or whatever, like the, 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 the meat of Islam. You yeah. have to be really, um, you know, Arabic, you know, the terminology, you know, all this stuff. But like, you know this stuff. Yeah. Why you stay the Muslim? I honest looking back, looking back, I can only say that there was it was spiritual, really. Uh -huh. Looking back, I can't give you an, an, an intelligent reason right. why I remain Muslim, even though I knew these things. It was just this a spiritual stronghold that was upon me, mm -hmm. and at that at that time, then that last week of being Christian, it was broken from me when I was when my heart became soft and I was actually willing to really think about these things and really say these things out loud and especially when I picked the Bible up and read it and I saw and I read the gospel and I this is true I can't say this is I can't say this is not true it is true hmm. you know can you man mention like you start mentioning some things about Muhammad and Islam give me like several reasons why um a Muslim should not stay a Muslim. Why should, like, you left Islam because you found out this mm -hmm. stuff and you found the alternative as well. Yes. Like, can you give me, like, some reasons that we should think about? And we should, like, you mentioned how Muhammad lived. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, like, they always mention the Bible, but they are talking about the version that exists only in their minds. It doesn't exist in no reality, never existed in history. Yeah. So give me, like, solid reasons so people who will watch this will learn from your experience and will say, yes, I have to answer these questions. Okay. One thing I learned was that anyone can claim anything. Anyone can claim anything. That's why there are thousands of religions and thousands of sets and thousands of ideologies in the world because anyone can claim anything. But it's the, bur the burden of proof is on the claimant. Okay. So the person who makes the claim is burdened to prove what they have to say. So when the Muslims say, you know, when your imam tells you the Quran is corrupt, I mean the Bible is corrupt, that the Quran has never been changed, it's never been corrupt, and they tell you that all the previous messengers were Muslim, the burden of proof is on him to prove it, right? Mm. Me saying it, or just because I have an authoritative, you know, name behind me and I say it, that doesn't make it true. You mm -hmm. know, I could say that uh, Jesus was an alien. Right. Are you going to believe me, you know, right. just because I say it? I'm on TV, television now. Yeah. If I claim it, does that make it more authoritative? No. no. I, have to, I have to prove what I'm, have to, what I'm saying. So I began to realize the, the things Islam said about Jesus, about the Bible, about Christianity, about the origins of Christianity, they were claims. Mm. But I've never seen any real proof to substantiate any of these claims. And yes, people will talk about the Council of Nicaea, they will, they will talk about variations in some of the manuscripts of the Bible, but when you really investigate, investigate these things, you realize the conclusions that they they bring out from these so-called evidence isn't what they claim it is. Right? right. Right. You know. Right. So yes, there was a council on Nicaea, but there's no historical record that someone created the Bible at the council on Nicaea or created the deity of Christ there. Right. And the primary evidence doesn't say that. So show me primary evidence that says that. And up to this time, no one has been able to show me any primary evidence. Right. This is any of these things that you claim. So since you can't prove what you claim, I don't. I'm. I am personally not obligated to believe you or follow you. Mm. Right. I'm obligated to follow the truth. Right. And the truth is, there is a God. We know uh, there is God. For me, athe atheism was not an alternative. Mm. I knew there was a God, and I knew there there were prophets, and I knew that they received revelation. And I knew that some of the things that they were told had to do with the human condition. I am a sinner. 
that was a, another revelation that I received that weekend. I, I am a, my problem of why I don't have any assurance and my problem why I can't get myself together is that I'm a sinner. I really like sinning. You know, mm -hmm. despite this jalabia, despite the, the beard and going to the masjid and staying up all night, making a uh, night prayer at the root of my heart, I'm a sinner and I really love to sin. Right. I don't like, I, don't, I, I say I like God, but I don't like the things that God likes, really. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would love to have a ritual I can do that it just gets, gets, me, gets me into heaven. But God is a holy God. He's a holy God. Right. So even in Islam, they tell you, no one enters into Jannah unless they have a pure heart. Right. So how do you get your heart pure? By making wudu? Uh, if, I, if I rub tap water on my body, that's going to make my heart pure so I can stand in front of the holy God? Mm. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah? Right. It, it seems like it would take more than that. And then, you know, you have the story of Adam and Eve, right? Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve sin. And the Quran says, well, uh, Allah gave Adam some words. And he says repented. the words, yeah. he forgives them. Okay, if he forgave him, then why didn't they get to stay in Jannah? Hmm. Why am I not in Jannah? Right. What did I do to not to get kicked out of Jannah? You know? If I'm born pure, on the pure Islam, why can't I just be transported straight to Jannah? Why right. do I have to live this life in this world and face temptation and face shaitan? Mm. What did I do when I'm facing sin? Why do I sin? Why do all of us as human beings sin if we're all born upon the natural fitra? Right. I've, I've asked people this. What makes you sin? If, you, if you're born upon the natural fitra, why did you choose to sin? Why didn't you just stay pure? Well, you know, you can't stay pure because you're imperfect. Well, you're not really born on the natural right. fitra then. You, right. You're born sinful. Exactly. That's your imperfection, right? Right. Like, well, nobody wants to admit that. You know? So you found contradictions there. Yeah, it's, exactly. not, it's not consistent. Like exactly. It, and, and, and these led you to, to, to make a decision to go back to Christ. Uh, to, uh, to go to Christ for real this time. I don't mm. really consider the first time. Uh, it wasn't real. It was just, for me, it was a tradition. It was mm. a family tradition. But this time, supernaturally, I understood the gospel. I understood the gospel. I understood who Christ was, and I understood my condition as a sinner, that he was the Son of God who came to save me, and I needed his salvation or I was, not, I was going to hell. If I want you to summarize, like, the problem of Islam, why it will not solve your problem as a sinner. If, I, if you want to summarize Islam mm. and its problem, how are you going to put it in your own words? I would say that Islam makes God very cheap and petty. How? Because to appease God, a holy God, you're saying that sinners, all they have to do is do these rituals. So if imperfect sinners do these rituals, then they're going to appease God and they're going to earn their way into heaven. But when I look into the Bible and I look into the so-called previous messages, I don't see that. I saw a holy God, you know, when he set the temple up, they had to do things exact in a certain way. It's like the two, two men, I can't remember their name, but they offered a strange fire to the Lord. Mm. You know, they offered this strange fire that they had invented in their mind. They thought it was a good thing and they thought they were doing a good deed and God struck them dead. So why, 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 why did God strike, strike them dead? You can't just offer God anything. You know, this religion that Muhammad kind comes with is strange fire. Mm. before the real God, he's not going to accept it. God says in the word, you know, your, your deeds are like filthy rats to me. Right. You know, so you think you're doing something holy. Like I actually thought I was righteous when mm. I was Muslim. I, I can remember we used to stand outside the masjid and we would see the non-Muslims walk past and we would laugh at them. Because you know, look at these Kafirs, they're so dirty, you know, they're sinners, you know. We are the ones who are in the masjid. We're the ones who are upon Tawheed. Mm. We're the uh, righteous ones. So it's, it's <laughs> like kind of kibriya, like kibra, yeah. kibra, like we, Even we are. Even you, though you, you say in a religion you're not supposed to have kibra, yeah. but you do. You do. Yeah. Especially people, and people know this in Islam, people who really follow the Quran and Sunnah, who are really orthodox and, you know, strong in the deen, they have lots of pride in themselves. Right. You have to, if you think you're going to, you're earning points, to get into heaven, that's prideful in, in itself. 
Right. I don't care what you you try to say you're humble or whatever you try to say about yourself. If you think you're earning points with God and God, you know, he's he's very excited about these points you're doing and all these rituals, he's going to give you his heaven. You know, he's going to allow you to come in his presence because of the things you do that in it in by itself, that's pride. Right. And and like why why Americans convert to Islam? Can you give me the reasons behind it? Like I want to understand. Well, um, I, I, from what I understand, the two biggest parties that are coming to Islam in America are African American men and Caucasian women. Hmm. And Caucasian women are coming because a lot of them have relationships with Muslim men, so there's love involved in that. The Caucasian men, it's uh, uh, African American men, it's a lot of things I said in the beginning of the article, um, growing up, uh, believing, being told that the Christianity is the white man's religion, it's not the religion of your ancestors, growing up believing that Islam, that's the religion of people from Africa, you know, that's, that was the religion of your African uh, ancestors, and wanting to know the truth, wanting to know what's What's really true, and a lot of, and a lot of African American men, not everyone, but everyone, you know, some of them, you know, they grow up without fathers, mm -hmm. right? And they grow up in single parent, female led homes, and unstable neighborhoods. Islam it offers, you know, the discipline, the stability that you feel like you lack growing up. So I can get my life together. You know, I may find myself in a situation because. I've read a statistic, 18% of the prison population is Muslim. Hmm. So you have guys there, they've gotten themselves in trouble. They're in prison. They've obviously lived very undisciplined lives. That's why they're in prison. Right. So Islam offers a way now you can be righteous. You know, you can get your life together. You can order your steps and order and discipline your life and change yourself. You can, bring, you can take on a completely different identity. How can we as Christians give a message of hope to people and giving them um, what they really lack and showing them that Islam is a false um, appearances, like when they go deep, they will not find what they are looking for. How can we get this message out? Well, Christians need to equip themselves, mm. you know. There's a, there's a science in Christianity of apologetics, but for some reason, I don't know why, it's, there are a lot of apologists out here, but it's died down with the average Christian, the everyday Christian, because you, can, you just can't have big name people who are going to stand up and do things. We, the average everyday Christian needs to take the information they see from the person on television, on the internet or whatever, they need to take that information and they need to take it to work. You need to take it to the neighbor. You need to take it to the guy at the store. Right. You know, to disseminate this information. So the average Christian needs to take on the Great Commission and witness, and they need to prepare themselves to be able to witness, and they need to be ready to defend the faith and offer some uh, offense. You need to tell people who are thinking about becoming Muslim or who are Muslim, who are converted to Islam, the things that they don't know. Mm. Because there are a lot of things about Islam that Muslims don't know. Do you think it's it's hidden on purpose, or like just because they don't want to talk about it? Um, and give me some examples, please. Well, I think some of it's on purpose. You know, people don't talk about uh, like uh, okay, for instance, as an African American, you know, I was told that you know Islam was the religion of my ancestors. Right. right. And that Islam was a universal brotherhood. There's no, you know, black, there's no white. Everybody's, Muhammad treated everyone equal. You know, when you come into the mosque, you know, you stand next to an Arab, you stand next to someone from Africa, you stand next to an Asian, you all line up as brothers. And unlike Christianity, you know, you have the black church and the white church and this church and that church. So, I mean, but I never knew that, you know, Muhammad in a, an authentic hadith, he was with his companions and a black man walked past and he says, if you wanted to see what shaitan looks like, look, look to this man. You know, shaitan looks like a black man, mm -hmm. you know. So, so black skin is something evil? What, what's that about, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? And I didn't know th that Muhammad owned slaves. Right. You know, he had a, a slave that they called the ship. 
<laughs> you know, because mm. he carried, he would carry so many loads. He was like mm. a ship. Oh, well, that's not, well, that's not the side of Muhammad that I was told about. You know, mm. I didn't know that, you know, that Arabs, there was a hierarchy that, you know, Allah looked upon the earth and he saw the Arabs and he liked them the best. And he saw the tribe of Quraysh and he liked them the best. And then he looked to uh, Muhammad's family and then he looked at Muhammad and he, and he, these are the people he liked the best. He didn't pick, so the hadith doesn't say he picked because Muhammad was so, and his family was so righteous because right. they were pagans. Right. right. He just liked these Arabs the best, you know. <laughs> you know, what kind of, that's, that's a contradiction in what you're telling me. Right. So, and I, I didn't know about these things to years after I took my shot. So you, you, you felt like you have been deceived somehow. Yeah. Exactly. Like the, the, the message is so, so uh, like nice and all the nice things in Islam and the, the rest is, is, is hidden. Exactly. You, you have to study and dig for it. it we, yeah. they, they will not show it to you. How about jihad? Well, that's another thing. You know, a lot of times these guys, they go out and they make dawah. They tell people, well, you know, uh, you know, jihad is just defensive. Mm. You know? Wouldn't you defend yourself? Wouldn't you defend your family? Right. If someone wanted to attack you? Look at the war in Iraq, how the Americans came and they invaded Iraq. You know, look what they're doing across the world. That's just Muslims defending themselves. Right. You know, but they don't tell you about Muhammad and his companions in, uh, invading tribes and taking tribes of, of, of Jews and chopping all the men's heads off and taking the women as concubines and, and wives. Nobody, nobody ever tells you that part, right. you know? Because if you knew that part, then the whole thing about just defense would, would make sense, you know? They don't, they don't tell you about abrogation. Hmm. They don't tell you about how when Muhammad's early life and the, the Hadith and the parts of the Quran, the people like to quote about peace, and if you, ki if you kill one person, it's like you killed the whole world and all the these things have been abrogated, hmm. you know? So all, what's left now is offensive jihad, that the, uh, the leader of the Muslims needs to take the sword, and the Muslims are obligated to take the sword to the kufar, to the non-believers. Now, in the, under certain situations, we can revert back. We can revert, revert back to these passages that have been uh, abrogated until we become strong. Then when we become strong, it's time for jihad. Right. But nobody tells you that part. Wow. How did you find about it? <laughs> you had well, to dig yourself? Yeah, but see, like I said, um, as a Salafi Muslim, you know, I had spent all my time reading the Quran, um, in English and Arabic. I, you know, I had a goal to try to f read all of Surah, I mean, uh, Sahih Bukhari. So uh, I got maybe halfway through it, you know. I'm reading the whole entire books of Hadith. Right. So, so the, the Hadith are there. Right. You read them. So, you know. But if, you, if, you, if you're not a type of Muslim who does that study, you just go to the mosque and you just pray and, you know, that's it. Maybe you listen to a, you know, the sermon. That's as far as you go. You wouldn't know. Going back to your story, were you able to, to talk to your wife and get your son and explain to her, like, what happened and the big change that happened into your life? Well, yeah, she definitely wanted to know what happened. Like, because everybody shot, you know, everybody was shot. How mm. did this guy become Christian? So I, I explained it to her and she said, well, I thought about it. And so at this point, she doesn't know what direction she wants to go. But as far as my son, I take my son to church every single week. And um, my son, he has a child's Bible. I read it to him, you know. So and you, has... you went back together yeah. as, as a husband and wife? No, we, we, have, we, we have not gone back together. Okay. But uh, this is the time I spend with my son. Okay. So I, you know, I basically I train my son in the Bible. I I, I take apologetics, and I bring it down to his level, okay. and I and I explain the word and why Jesus is who he is. To and him. she's okay with that. She's perfectly fine with that. Perfectly fine with that. Okay. And um, I mean, um, things that you are doing right now are they uh, for like. I don't know what you are doing right now, actually. So yeah. um, can you explain what are you doing in ministry and preaching uh, the word to Muslims? You have a great story. You have a good experience. Where are you trying to invest your story in favor of people who might be deceived the same way? Yeah. 
like I said, after I confessed Christ, I, I felt an overwhelming feeling that I needed to tell people, mm. you know, tell people what happened to me. And I, I started making these YouTube videos uh, talking about Islam and how I became Christian. Um, I sent an email off to ABN, uh, you know, and they put me in contact with David Wood. So me and David Wood met each other and we've done things in ministry together. Sam Shimon, I've done things with him. Um, I've done things at the Arab Festival, passing out tracts. I've appeared on a few shows. I'm here speaking with you, you know. That's so good. these are the opportunities that the Holy Spirit has opened for me to, to preach Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, brother, and God bless you, and uh, God bless your family, your ministry, your son, and everything you are doing. Thank you. Thank you.